Yeah, no, this works. Awesome. Um, so yeah, today our guest speaker is Beer. He's a software engineer at Google AI. His interests are machine learning with applications to computer vision and language. And so let's welcome our speaker. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about research that I've done in yeah, the past year. And um, before I do that, let me talk a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from USC a year ago, and I'm glad to be connected to some of you, uh, to all of you uh, in some way. <laughs> um, I worked on machine learning, vision, and NLP, and these are basically the keywords. So over the year, I kind of moved more toward applications um, I worked on zero shot learning for object recognition and multitask learning for sequent tracking. That work is probably the only NLP NLP thing that I've done. Um, and now I do vision LF. All right, so what do you mean by this? So there's this cool video. I don't know if you guys have seen this. But basically, it is kind of summarize what happens in vision, language vision and actions world. And since year 2013, you kind of see that you know people try to fill all this space, right? Um, and my vision and language research kind of fall to the bottom here. Uh, Basically, it's, uh, there's no action there, but obviously we want to move toward that. Um, so all these tasks involve generating text or classification to text, and whether you use image and text or image, image and text or image and region, depending on the task. And these are the tasks. Okay. Image captioning, VQA, and controllable crowd image captioning. All right, so just to be clear what the task is, image captioning, I guess you guys know, right? Uh, given an image, speed it up, what's in an image? Visual question answering, you can ask about anything. What color is the clock? Is it green? What color is this car? Is it white? and so on. For the control image captioning, you can kind of like, you know, draw a box here and say, and okay, it should say a green clock nearby by the street. We can have like a sequence of boxes and say, yeah, two men are talking outside behind the end of the green clock. Okay, so is it, are the task clear to every, everyone? All right, so to compare a little bit, um, so for image captioning information that you often describe is about this global information, global, you talk about, you know, the whole high level thing about an image. Whereas um, controllable image captioning or visual question answering usually is about local regions. I mean, not always, right? Because you can ask questions like describe an image to me and becomes and image captioning task. And then the output text, besides visual question answering, other things are free form and open-ended. So we have to make use of the text generation metrics, you know, like blue, rouge, and so on. When it's chart, you can kind of resort to accuracy. So, because it's more well defined, more likely to be agreed upon, but that's still not perfect either. All right, so the theme that I kind of, you know, will use throughout this task is basically try to connect the two modality in a, like more tightly manner. Okay, let's start with image captioning. So this is the most popular benchmark for image captioning, MS Coco. And who here thinks that um, image captioning is solved? 
Okay, I'm glad that's, okay, I'm glad no one thinks that. <laughs> and he went on MS score four, right? Um, the side scores around one point something uh, out of 10. <laughs> Right. So what's good about this, okay, you can look at the caption, it's pretty good, right? Uh, and you have, in terms of quantity per image, it's good. There are five per image. Quality is pretty good. You know, it's human curate data set. And it's also good for an, uh, understanding relationships between tasks because just people just keep annot annotating Coco basically, right? So there's key points and poor human policies boxes and you know segmentation mass on top of coco and people build data sets on top of coco like visual genome is coco based visual question answering is coco based this vqa gqa and visual genome has its own question answering and it's like this new data set inside segmentation is based on coco again now the bad is that this is pretty small and so by an industry standard, 120K is definitely small, but I think even in academia, these days 120K, you may consider small, right? Because ImageNet, you, know, you have, a, I don't know, an order of millions, and that's this image classification. And also MS Coco Caption is not quite diverse, visually and linguistically. I'm gonna see, so to support this point, this, this benchmark called no caps where you know basically basically this they introduce this new task because it seems that coco only involved these common generic objects not diverse at all and in, in it cannot cover this out of domain objects in an open image in an open image data set you know like this object Goat and dolphin. So that's kind of like a supporting evidence why Coco is not good. And if you look at this object frequencies in Coco, so so <coughs> orange refers to the objects that appear in Coco captions. As you can see, you know, it's at the head of the distribution, right? Um, what you talked about, there's something around there. And I cannot even show you the the whole distribution is long tail thing, right? right? So there's these two kind of drawbacks and which makes it, you know, in practice, if you train image mapping model on Coco, it will not work well in the wild. So in the wild, it is kind of extreme. This is not even self-driving car, you know, like it's not in really in the wild, but at least and in the web, it's not, you know, it's not working. And to illustrate this point, there's this paper in 2016. So the image caption system here are not, you know, not like advanced or anything. But let's say you train image captioning on Coco data set and test it on Coco and test it on Instagram images. As you can see, this is human evaluation, right? So here, the percentage of bad captions is around 23. So, okay, embarrassing. So combined is about 25%. He is almost half, basically. Actually more than half, right? When it is on Instagram. So what's the alternative then if I don't want to use Coco? So you can consult the web and see whether you can find any image and text relationship. And there's this thing called alternate text where, you know, you look at for each image, you can kind of find text. And if you do image filtering well, text filtering well, image and text filtering well, you know, kind of pre-process, pre-processing text well, you're gonna get kind of image plus text data set. Do you guys know what this data set is called? Anyone knows? So this is called conceptual captions, <laughs> which is which was invented a year ago by Piyush, who is in our team. 
And I mean, again, it's for if I kind of show it pick here, but you know, in this for example, it's pretty good, right? Uh, image and text. But you can kind of see that images may be different from what Coco has, right? And you look more into this, you can kind of see that, oh, there's like all these diverse domains and, you know, probably visual objects. You know, there's something outdoor, indoor, out this world, uh, you know, zoom in, abstract, multiple objects, black and white, and color images. So to summarize, MS Coco, it has uh, basically, so okay, conceptual capturing is much larger, an auto, auto of magnitude larger, even though we have only one caption per image. The, even though it's not gold captions, so there's some human evolution evaluation that shows that this zero data has 90% precision. And you can get a wide variety of images, NDPs and language styles as you can see in these examples here. All right, now let's kind of repeat that experiments, right? Train, uh, we have system train on Coco, and now let's have another system train on conceptual captions. And we kind of select these images. And you know, it's clear that, you know, this kind of things you find on a web, so, you know, Conceptual captions have no problem with describing this as cartoon businessman and so on. All right, now I'm gonna do like a dot of domain experiments, a little bit just like the Instagram experiments that I show, right? Use Flickr data set as a test set. So, so this one plus two plus three, three plus just means the number of annotators that say captions are good. Right, so three plus means, you know, three, three annotators say the caption is good. So, train on Coco, they're gonna get around 20%, 27% of captions that three people say are good. And it becomes 35.5 when you train on this conceptual caption. All right, so what I wanna talk a little bit in next probably 20, 25 minutes. It's basically our solution to captioning on conceptual captions. And this is basically the EMNOP paper. And also we submit the system to uh, conceptual caption challenge at CBPR this year. Okay, let's go. So image captioning pipelines mostly you're gonna follow this, right? You know, you have these two components, visual feature extractor and caption generator, right? And in this paper, it's more about the first part. Uh, and we ask, can we leverage a large amount of data to push the limits of visual featureization? Okay. Now let's step back a little bit. Why I want to improve visualization? So look at this images again, right? Uh, I'll be prepared. I'll be ready to deal with this, right? There's a lot. Of, I mean, diverse domains and visual concepts. Also, you know, as you the, come back to our, coming back to our core, we want to tightly connect vision and language, right? Can I can I should I be able to say that that yellow flower is feminine? Or can I differentiate between starfish and seashell? Right. <laughs> and a high level, higher, like more so, so, uh, philosophical level, you know, which certain uh, in his piece, he said, the biggest lesson that can be read from 70 years of air research is that general methods that leverage competition are ultimately the most effective and by a large margin. So this is kind of related. I guess he talked about uh, image net revolution. And I just went to this talk at ICCB and I kind of like it. So basically, Andres Kapati, who is the director of AI at Tesla, basically said, you know, 
tau pair 1 pi o is going to be solved by 2 pi do, where gradient descent is going to write program for you. <laughs> and um, it's kind of wild, right? But I mean, given this meta learning booming right now, so it may not be far away. And there's this gap between academia and industry somehow where, you know, he spent a lot of, I don't know if you guys can see it very well, but um, basically he spent a lot of time on models and algorithms during his PhD. But on when yeah, he moved to Tesla, he has to work a lot on data sets. There's this gap, right? And kind of maybe in the future, what we will be doing is labeling the data and maintaining surrounding data infrastructure. So I feel like it's kind of cool. So I'm not saying that, you know, models and algorithms are not important, but maybe it's less important than you think they are. All right. <laughs> so I guess I made a point about why improve visualization. Now let's look at you can ask, uh, you know, first question that you could ask, what kind of, you know, the most simplest visual feature extractor that I could have okay. and start from there. <clears throat> and of course, you know, you can use this, you know, uh, network train on image net. And this is basically what these four papers or five papers in 2014 did for image captioning. Uh, but the recent trend is that, so in that ImageNet uh, architecture is going to give you a single feature vector for each image. Right? The trend is to move from that single vector to a set of feature vectors that describe different regions in images. So what I'm, I'm going to describe about is basically the work from this guy, Peter Anderson, who's going to join us soon. And uh, how many people here know Visual Genome? Three. All right. So, okay, let me describe this a little bit. It's basically, yeah, the aim was to basically to connect vision and languages. So you kind of, kind of, you have like, like very dense annotation for images. So people, uh, they call it scenes graph. But basically what you can do is basically kind of say, for example, in this pink, box black motorcycle on land can kind of convert to like a black motorcycle here, right? So there's going to be attributes and objects. So this relationship too, but in this case, uh, it didn't seem to be helpful uh, for our, our case. Uh, but yeah, at the end, you get a bunch of these boxes, right? And basically this task is basically object detection, right? And this is a basically the set of visual visual features that I described, right? So I'm gonna pre-process visual genome and pick an object detector to train on it. And the most popular one these days is the parser or CNN. It's a two-stage object detector, which means that what you're gonna get out of this is okay. Um, in, includes regions, you know, like. There's going to draw boxes and you know, to cover objects and also features for each of these boxes. Okay. So, faster as it is trained to predict object plus attributes of visual team. Right, so is, is everything clear at this point? Any questions? How, how smart are they kind of looking at context? So, for example, it might be easy to recognize one of the persons as a person with high reliability. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones on their own might be a little bit harder to identify, but then given the context that you've identified one. It's kind of mysterious. Uh, I'm kind of not sure to what extent it looks at context, but since you do this region of interest pooling here, I assume that, I mean, based on qualitative results, I kind of have the feeling that it does look at the context, but I am kind of not sure here in this case. Yeah. Um, are you, is this architecture making a hard decision about the regions or is it soft? Uh, it's a regression problem. 
so you uh, you know regress to a coordinate. No, I get that you're trying to learn them, but right. you're ultimately just making a, a vector, right? At the end of the day, and so uh, just when you're doing inference for a new image, do you does the model make a choice of regions, a hard choice of regions, as opposed to keeping a you know probability of many regions? At right. Once? It, yeah, they are. Yeah, they're making that choice. Yes. Um, but there's like a lot of details on top of this, you know, like non-maximum separation to make sure that, you know, we don't see like, you know, all two overlap the region or something. Okay. Now let's look at, so this is image I picked from conceptual captions. I apply this culture as in and train on visual genome on it. And these are the top six object. And I, you know, I draw a box with color there. So I guess that's the best it can do, right? You know, uh, this is a woman in orange dress and orange skirt uh, in front of White House, right? And I mean, if you look at what information, what information did we give to the object detector, this is not surprising. This CNN is basically pre-trained on ImageNet, so we have information about thousand categories. And visual genome has kind of thousand objects, like you know, sixteen hundred objects plus four hundred categories. So one way you can fix this, right? I wanna, I want, I want the model to be able to, yeah. Are these labels hierarchical in any way? So that's like a monk, which is maybe a, a kind of a man, or, um, or are they just flat, flat? Yeah, so this guy, Peter Anderson, he did kind of pre-processing to some degree, but yeah, there's no hierarchy called. Basically, he kind of took care of synonyms to some degree, like, you know, man. Yeah, I kind of don't remember exactly, but yeah, no hierarchy, no hierarchy. No. All right. Um, one way to fix this is, you know what, why, why don't you, uh, okay, why don't we draw boxes and relabel this, right? Uh, so I'm gonna relabel this as a mark, for example. Um, so you can construct a new object detection data set <coughs> for say, image from the same domain as conceptual captions. Um, but as you can see, this is very expensive, right? We want to build a big data set, okay, object detection data set on a you know million kind of scale. So basically, this paper is the idea is very simple. Basically, what we propose is basically you just need to reuse boxes. So of course, maybe you recognize this is wrong that it is is woman. But you can reuse boxes, but and then and then you featureize this box well. And what I mean by well, I'm gonna use a large amount of image level image level label data here. Okay, and that is where this how to fine frame semantic levels come in. So what I mean by that is that this is the uh, granularity at the level of instant, you know, not bridge or still red bridge, but golden gate bridge. Um, this is kind of like visual genome in a way, like, you know, um, attribute plus object. And yeah, we have this framework called graph rise. And I guess the details don't matter. But basically, this is basically a noisy 40 million classes that they try to classify into. And at the end, you can use this to featureize each of the boxes provided by Parser Asin. All right. Great. Uh, in the in this one, what scraps of unlabeled images? Oh, I mean, this is basically just regressor. So you can kind of use unlabeled images to kind of, uh, you know, constrain similarity between your image features. I think I'm missing something 
you started, you, you talked about a way to fix this. What was the problem? The problem is that is the visual genome output wasn't as good as you wanted. Right. Okay. The, and the features is going to be features that say this thing is a woman, right? And you're going to be using this for your image captioning models. And that's not a woman. Is that a woman? It's a monk. It's a monk. They're all men. Okay. So, so, okay. so the point is, you want those, you want those labels. You want, you want explicit features in your um, image captioning, right? And you want them to be better than. So, what do you mean by explicit? As so we, to a, a node in it. Right. So we actually don't use uh, woman text. But yeah, we did use features, but features are going to be correlated with women. I mean, but it, it is, it's, um, ex it's explainable. You can inspect it sure. and find something. Sure. You can actually yeah. make it. Right. OK. Yeah, glad that you asked. I feel like, OK, you uh, you use features from Foster and CNN for downstream tasks, right? So I mean, everyone keep this in mind. Gotcha. Um, so this part is out of five frame now, right? You can reuse boxes. <clears throat> All right. So just an extra thing here, we also do this MD entity embeddings. Basically, it's kind of like external knowledge. Where if you use a uh, Google Card, you can get this uh, entities in the knowledge graph. So here to say it is like you know order site, and you kind of get you can get entity embeddings based on this knowledge graph. All right, so summaries of visual features extraction. You're going to extract regions from faster RCNN and then use graph rise to featureize it. So we get out of five frame semantic labels, features. And then you can kind of add this extra external knowledge as well. All right. So I know those are the main focus is on the first part, but let me describe this second part really quickly. So normally this is going to be encoder decoder model, right? And this day you got to use transformer, um, and basically it's a you know trap of self attention layers. I guess I mean NLP people know this <laughs> more than I do, um, but Instead of say you know source language or you know or text that you want to summarize, you uh, use as input a uh, sequence of images, uh, image feature vectors instead, right? Uh, and then there's no positional encoding. I guess you could encode the location of the boxes, but it doesn't matter here in this case, right? You can swap this box. It's still a set of feature vectors. Right, so in the end, one go global feature vector by grain, you have you make a choice whether. So this is what we want to compare. You make a choice whether you want to use default features by parser RCNN, or better features. At least what we think better features, and then some entity features. So you use that as a sequence of feature vectors. You input it to the model. So in a sense, the model is kind of funny well. All right, I'm gonna show the metric using CIDR. Uh, sorry. So then in that case, uh, you didn't in, in, uh, explicitly add any inductive bias from those like uh, like special relationships of those extracted features. Right? That's true. That's so you true. basically just uh, try to uh, rely on the attention mechanism to try to find it. That's true. So. And yeah, that's one drawback of this model. There's room for improvement for that for sure. We do try to incorporate position, meaning location of boxes, right, right, right. but it didn't seem to help. I'm just curious, like if you add the regressed uh, bounding box, like those four numbers, like would it just automatically resolve, resolve that? As a yeah, as object, a I guess the main thing is just that object detection model is kind of big and it's kind of very, computationally expensive for you to do that. But yeah, I guess training this jointly would be one good way to go. Cool. Mm -hmm. 
uh, cider is uh, let me let okay let me see if I can get this correctly. <laughs> uh, basically, you use both precision and recall with some reweights, and these weights comes from kind of like a corpus statistic of the captions. So, um, all right. So this is cider. So remember there are four type of visual features, right? And the one with ultra give really high cider score, right? either global or regional. And then entity and default features by Farsar and CNN are not so good. Now I wanna add each of these three colors to the global features. And turns out again that ultra uh, is the most com complementary, meaning once you add to the global features, the, in the gap between the baseline and the ends Big, uh, the uh, biggest. You were gonna. No, no, no. I'm just looking. Okay. Right. And then, okay, I'm gonna rescale this. And then, basically, the best model is basically you combine global plus region ultra plus entity, right? Instead of global plus region F R C N N plus entity. So this kind of say say that okay, so. Region ultra outperform region faster RCNN basically. Now we submit this thing to the CV power challenge and we get this number. Um, so there's other you know metric there as well. So rouge, I guess it's like in summarization. Um PIS is um kind of incorporate scene graphs uh into the metric. Sorry, is a perfect score in CIDR 1? Uh, no, 10. Uh, yeah. And then after the challenge, we, you know, let it run longer. And right now, our result is basically the best, current best single model. All right, let's look at some examples. So now, so I just show the box thing, just, you know, illustrate the point, how superior the features are. Um, Monks walking in front of the temple now. I mean, not really walking, right? Cleaning, but at least you get monks and a temple. Uh, she has seats. Uh, I don't know about you, but I myself cannot differentiate between <laughs> so me, seats and uh, she seats. Um, I guess I, little, I need a little bit more training. In this case, you get staircase, which is nice. And, you know, Christmas tree in a toy car relationship is not right, but it's not general general thing like digital art selected for the sharp. Um, another example. So this is hard, right? Seems hard. Uh, the crowd truth is simple illustration of a Thanksgiving card, and this is snowman and a hat and scarf, right? This is kind of embarrassing, right? And then all these three you say perfect. Kind of. Yeah. All right. So is it surprising? No. I mean, you kind of see this before, right? Orange dress, woman, orange skirt. There's no way you have you kind of forced to correlate, say, woman with orange dress with monk, for example, but not so way the case, right? Uh, here you have to correlate in basically image captioning model has to correlate carrots and heart and birds, birds here with a Thanksgiving greeting card. Yeah, is there any feature in there that has anything to do with the card? I guess words and letters. Mm, right, hat maybe. Is cartoon part of that? Those are the, that's your interpretation of the fine grained features? Okay, I would thought I would make it more fine grained than that. And so, like, no, this is by faster RCNN. Oh, sorry, not so. So much. yeah, so that's why it's so bad. <laughs> so cat, yeah, we definitely don't want cat up here, right? <laughs> that's bad. so. Okay, this is why basically you get something <laughs> like snowman in a hat and a scarf, basically. Okay, and now there's a lot of other words that kind of appear in the, when you use this this ultra fine grain features, right? You know, like lollipop, 
not kind of structure or JQuery stuff. And these do not happen when you use cluster asynchronous features. And again, you can take a look at this all day. And you know, probably I cannot infer lollipop from red frisbee <laughs> and green balloon. And maybe why breeding is too general for me to know whether it is a mark count structure or not. And this is basically sky, you know, this is not even in the sea, right? And so on. All right, so conclusion here is that um, this is kind of a way you can get uh, good features for image captioning models. Okay, I have 20, 10, 10 15 minutes. Um, I guess the question that you may ask whether this is good for week two A as well, right? And I wouldn't be asking this question if the answer is not yes. So let's talk about week A really quickly. So this is the most popular bench fund. So this is like a core core of visual question and string. week A 2.0. And these are the questions, right? Now let's look at VQA data sets that we want to use a little bit. I want to kind of talk about why I want to use um, VQA 2.0 in, in detail, but you can see that again, all these things are <coughs> cocoa based in some way. You know, even though, I mean, GKA, for example, based on visual genome, visual genome based on cocoa. And I can kind of trace a lot of things back to cocoa. <coughs> The things we want to be going to be using, even though it's small, but we think it's very useful. It's this data set called Wispis. And basically, this is the real questions asked by blind people. Right? Uh, so think about this a little bit. Uh, would blind people ask how many children are in the bed? And think about that a little bit. Maybe as a follow up question, right? But mm, maybe not. Okay. So it's kind of more realistic and actually, you know, you said blind people are asking this, right? You said blind people? It's blind, yeah. What is the prompt first? So there's no prompt. So they, they, they take a picture. So this is an, an app. Basically, they take a picture on their cell phone and they ask questions. So normally that would be like default to answer that question. But I guess we can kind of replace these people with like a VCA system. I guess that's the motivation. All right. So this data set came out last year. Uh, so look at, you know, normal VCA pipeline. Again, you're gonna see this object detection features, right? Which is not surprising that, okay, details don't matter. We use by the uh, V0.1. <laughs> And then you can replace it again with other frame <laughs> objects and features. And it's um, you can kind of start to recognize this fine grain stuff, you know, barbecue sauce instead of beer. I mean, in particular, this number and other question, you kind of start to do better. Overall, we get like 3% improvement. And improvement comes from number and others uh, a lot. Okay? And we submit this thing to the leaderboard, and we were at the top as of June this year. Not anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, the world is moving fast this day. All right, so the conclusion. I guess, method for image captioning and VQA, right? I guess since there's a lot of NP people here, I guess I can rephrase a little bit to be the couple visual word segmentation plus discriminative meaning representation. See whether you like it. And I guess this allow us to tightly connecting vision to language. All right. Uh, okay, let me use maybe five minutes to talk about this. I think this is really cool. So this is a work in submission. Uh, so the motivation here is that think, think a little bit, you have a set of visual features, uh, visual regions, right? 
but you have a sequence of target work and you don't know which to align with which. Okay. So in image captioning, basically. Okay. So if you know which a lot is aligned with which, then you kind of do visual grouting. And this professor said, students would like to work on complex reasoning tasks, but I want to spend time on basic tasks like visual grouting, with the belief that grouting is basically a fundamental building block for image and language tasks. And basically, this is the main idea. That's what we're trying to achieve, you know? And this work is led by, you know, these two guys. Um, the main idea is that you wanna, uh, you ask an annotator to move the mouse while describing an image. And then after that, you ask them to transcribe what they just said, right? So at the end, you can, kind, you can see that there's alignment between all this, I mean, color, color kind of correspond to uh, like a temporal alignment here, right? So when you talk about the balloon, when it's a uh, kind of orange, where's balloon? Is that balloon? Yeah, here. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's kind of green or yellow. But yeah, basically, you know, you, you get an idea, right? You know, you kind of have this alignment between image, text, and speech. Let me show you the video. Maybe this would be more clear with the, yeah. Different portion of the picture, we can see a grass area with a dried there is a woman standing wearing a light blue jeans and an ash color long t-shirt. Okay, I think you guys get an idea. So, so once we ask an annotator to transcribe this, there's no alignment to the mouth trace yet, but you can kind of do that with, uh, you know, try to use ASR which has alignment, and then you do this alignment between the two texts again, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, and now I kind of kind of get grouting in a fast way, right? So, oh, I so go around that area when I talk about ship, spectacles, open land with some grass on it, or main stairs. Main stairs is basically text. Okay, uh, compared to say, Clicker entities who crowd, I mean, which crowd only nouns, you know, this draw box for nouns. Coco doesn't have anything, of course. Visual genome would be something like, you know, for each box trying to, you know, ground some long sentences to it, right? And here it's more like every word, you know, you have this crowding basically to the location of, the, of an image, right? And there's a lot of applications that you could do with this, not just for image and text, because it involves speech as well, right? Okay, let me show you really quickly. So basically, you can do control image captioning by mouse trace, right? I mean, converting this trace into a sequence of bounding boxes and describe it an image. So. Here, the CIDR score is really high when you incorporate trace position, uh, just because it corresponds well with the, with the target, right? Because the target has some kind of a control to it. Uh, I, I just show you examples, I guess. Um, here, you know, the red thing is like the trace, right? And here, without the trace, it just ignore, uh, you know, these two guys uh, on the sky entirely. And here you can kind of see a person skiing on the keyboards, sitting here. This is even more wide, you know, I mean, because the trace is so long, so, you know, um, it describes about donuts, which is kind of important here. It describes about this part, this hot part, you know, white color paper attached to the machine. Um, Right, and I know I said I didn't do image generation, but did this guy play with it? And it's really cool, you can kind of, you know, 
Oh, I'm going to draw, can you see it here, four? And then water, person, umbrella, and then mountain. You can kind of see that board, board kind of change throughout the way to, uh, and you know, the same thing here. So conclusion, this, I, this concept of localized narrative, how you collect the data this way, allow you to tightly connect vision and language. All right, um, yeah, it's 15 now. So I just wanna talk about my current interest and in ongoing work very like quickly. I won't say much about it, but yeah. Uh, here we go. Um, Semi-supervised learning for image representations. So along the line of uh, ultra paper, but I guess you could do more as is, uh, I don't know, someone said something about context. We don't really, you know, we featureize this visual region separately. Why, in fact, we should looking at the whole image and kind of thinking about context and composition. Uh, I'm interested in visual grounding at scale or controllability, accuracy, and robustness. So I kind of show controllability. I mean, I don't think we can could claim anything in that in that experience about accuracy, right? Because it's kind of about preferences of the user, you know, how they move the mouse race and so on. Visual grading should help with the robustness of this. And the last thing is that I want to make this more useful to the blind and the visually impaired. In a you know similar spirit as with Swift. Okay, let me email go through this really quickly. So I guess the most the most relevant work right now for visual grading at scale is basically all this vision and language bird that was introduced that were introduced this year. Okay, there's so many of them, probably more right now. Uh, and okay, let's pick view bird and then look at they have some visual this figure nine the appendix of the you know papers that just came out like three days ago maybe and i kind of see that's like a exist some kind of visual crowding in there even though region and words are not connected uh, even though you don't give that supervision basically so for example boy would correspond to all these regions so I think it's cool, and one more, more on that. <laughs> now for the more useful part to the blind, I think it's really important to understand that blind people really want to understand text. And um, if you look at even identification question, it's actually about OCR, right? Um, regular or Okay, of course, if you have like a world knowledge about what color of diet Pepsi looks like, you probably can answer this question. But you could just read it. Well, so reading will, will uh, can can boost the performance a lot. But this, of course, depends on accuracy for OCR, how you incorporate OCR and so on. And here we kind of basically connect vision and language, literally. <laughs> Right. Also, there's this gap between objects that looks good and objects in a while that that blind people would take because you know. Um, okay, I have a slide, but I, I don't know why I didn't show. But yeah, basically, you know, if you ask about the color of the shirt, this is the picture that you're probably gonna get. You know, and you don't know whether this is shirt. You're kind of not sure whether it's shirt. And you can, you know, even your similar thing like rotation, back, background, and viewpoint, this is not doing very well. So there's a thing called object net. Uh, please feel free to check it out. I think it's by MIT, IBM a few days ago. I think it's really cool. Right? Okay, to conclude, so takeaways, two messages. 
the first one is that visual representation should be discriminative enough before we connect it to language. And the second message is that you can use this localized narrative as a scalable method to connect vision and language densely, right? At every word, at a word level. And also this is true for control. How you control the captions, how you control generation. Okay, I wanna acknowledge all these people. Uh, and yeah, um, be happy to take any questions. to get your annotations of other people like you know drawing over their images mm. so we have internal thing i don't know if um yeah it's not i don't know how much i should say um but yeah uh, it's an internal thing and yeah i'm not too familiar with it because i'm not i wasn't the one who collected the data set but um I don't know if it's a secret. Yeah. So. I don't know if it's a. Thank you. The other question. I can ask another one if you want. So. Oh, yeah. Did you want to ask a question? No, no, you can. So, um, uh, when it comes to visual question answering, right, like, so you're throwing everything in, right, of, from the image to answer the question. Um, but there's parts of the image that aren't important, right? Um, and so, and you're not, in, in the current work, you're not doing anything to explicitly, like, identify based on the question what the important part of the answer is, right? Right. Do you think it would be helpful to have that? Or do you have Yeah, I would say, I would say it's not explicit, but it's there. Yeah, trained through. Yeah, right? because, because you have this attention mechanism, right? Sure. I guess that's pretty much it, yeah. And there's this question, this like, you know, question attention, and this image question models also have attention. But yeah, of course, I think you can do kind of hard, hard filtering somehow based on question and image. I mean, you're doing, you're doing hard selection when you put your fine, ultra fine image features in, right? Um, I, I, maybe I don't understand completely about the details of, of what goes in, but I, I was, I guess, if there's something that's not in a box, right, the model can't see it. Is that true? Correct or no? In your in your framework, right, because you have no model. right now. Right now, let's say you have a hundred box, right? Yeah. You use that as the, everything as input, but hopefully attention weights. No, no, no with, you have the hundred boxes as input. Right. But if there's part of the image that's not in a box, is that is that seeable at any point by the um, the, part the, the image top. that not in the yeah, box. Part, parts of the image are not are not recognized as objects. Uh, I would say proposal from faster are not quite good. Normally they are objects. No, 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 no. I'm saying that there's parts of an image that are not object. They, they they actually do not contain an object, right? Like some part of the background. And so the bounding box does not cover that region, right? That's true. And that read that that portion of the image is not part of the image. Okay. That's now I understand it's your important. question. Yeah, there's some that some there exists some work that incorporate the global fe features as well. So I guess you could do that, right? And then that that would cover the whole thing. But yeah, again, of course, you can kind of select boxes for the background, mm -hmm. but probably wouldn't be too useful. Sure, I guess. Okay, we'll yeah. talk more. Right, cool. There are no other questions. I just want to quickly mention that if you want to meet, there's still one or two blocks, so you can just come up and talk to me after. If you have any other questions, you can come up um, and talk to Beer. Otherwise, let's give him another round of applause. Yeah, yeah. I want to like have some feedback from the chair.
I highlight it. Uh, okay. yeah. Because you wrote the cast, they're saying like sign of the